Hello, welcome to Waypoint Survival. Today, we're gonna to talk about seven wilderness survival priorities, plus one. Clear off some snow here. Find us a place to sit and uh, get rid of some of this snow. And, uh, clear us out a spot where we can have us a, a little fire and uh, boil some water or some cider. All right, looks pretty good. And we'll talk about some survival priorities. So obviously what you want to do in a survival situation is it's always good to have a, a tarp or something with you to lay out your gear on and then when you start to build your fire you want to make sure and put some sticks down first to protect your small flame from the uh, moisture in the ground which as the fire heats up turns the water or snow into steam and then uh, put your fire out. Hello spirit how are you doing? Huh? There you go. He loves the snow. It's definitely his kind of weather. You being a good dog today? Hmm? You like the snowy weather? You do, don't you? All right. We're going to start a fire and we're going to make some cider today. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right, so we're going to start our fire off today with a little tulip poplar bark. Again, I keep it in a Ziploc bag, keep it nice and dry. I have processed this ahead of time. The last thing you want to do is try and wait until you get out into the woods in a field and uh, have to get all your dry stuff then. It is snowing a little bit, but hopefully not enough to uh, bother our tender. Again, we want to process this up and uh, make a really fine cotton-like uh, wilderness tender ball here. Just this little bit of rubbing here, and you want to try to save all the powder that you can in your hand. Sprinkle that on top. It's the fine fluffy stuff that catches the spark. All right, put that down here in the center. The dust down in there. Get our ferro rod out. Kind of shield it with our body here. All right, we have flame. Let that grow a little bit here. Some of our our sticks. Put that on top here. Let it catch and grow. We'll get back with you. We've got our fire going well. We've got our water bottle here. And we're just going to place it next to the fire. Take the lid off, of course, so it doesn't melt. And we're just going to place it right beside the fire. Warm it up for our... There we go. 
warm it up for our apple cider we're going to have here in just a little bit. Today I want to talk to you about survival priorities. And of course now that I've started talking the uh, smoke is blowing right in my face. Move over a little bit here. There are seven priorities that we teach in survival that we should practice in any kind of situation and they are fire, water, shelter, food, signaling, navigation, first aid, and there's an eighth one that is actually self-protection. So let's start with fire. Fire is just a wonderful companion when you're out in the wilderness until the smoke blows in your eyes. Let's see if we can move over here and stay out of the out of the smoke. <laughs> okay, so the ability to make fire. And I just jotted down some ideas here on my Ride in the Rain notebook. I just wanted to share with you what I think uh, are the seven priorities plus one uh, of survival. So the ability to make fire and the knowledge of how to use it in various situations is going to be one of the most useful skills uh, that you're going to develop. Fire is a multi-tool. It cooks your food, it purifies your water, uh, it fire hardens the wooden tools that you make, and it also gives warmth or uh, will also provide light for you when you're out into the woods. Uh, it signals your rescuers, uh, scares away the boogeyman. <laughs> And uh, it also is nature's TV. Nothing like staring into the flames of a fire. Uh, it's just a very enjoyable experience uh, once you get a fire going. Even when you're scared and alone in a survival situation, fire is very, very companionable. It's probably the most important skill to own and learn. And I would say that of all the things that you should practice, that would probably be the first one that I would recommend that you really get good at is the ability to make fire, maintain fire in a multitude of environments. Uh, anybody can get a fire started uh, when it's you know the middle of August and hasn't rained for three weeks. So, uh, but when you really need it, uh, there's a saying that fire is hardest to start when you need it the most. So, I would definitely learn it. Always at least have three means of starting a fire with you. That can be up to you. I almost always have matches, a ferro rod, and a bic lighter. Uh, just as my standard equipment, I have other means as well with me in my fire kit. But that's just a really good uh, starting uh, place for me uh, with fire starting. All right, you should always uh, have dry tinder with you in a Ziploc bag. As you saw me uh, start the fire earlier, I also carry a small bundle of very dry twigs. And the reason for that is, as I found out over the years of doing this, that I can get out into a situation like this and really small dry twigs can be super hard to find. So I just go out uh, when it's dry and or, or even uh, when it's raining and just bring it in the house and let it dry and I always try to have at least a good handful of dry twigs in a Ziploc bag and I only use them when I really need them. If I can get dry tinder out here then I will do that. But just a good tip for you. Also, I always like to have what I call the first three stages of fire starting with me. Uh, when I go to start a fire. And of course the very first is some kind of tinder. This can be cotton balls, uh, soaked with petroleum jelly, it can be dryer lint, uh, it could be uh, any kind of uh, cedar or tulip poplar bark. Something that you know, you've practiced with, you've owned the skill and you can get a fire started when you need it. Uh, the second stage is a few small sticks of fatwood. And uh, that's to make of course curls and shavings and various other things. And then uh, number three I already mentioned is a small Ziploc bag full of dried twigs. So if you have those first three stages of fire starting with you in your kit at all times, you should be able to get a fire started in any kind of situation. The second survival priority that I would recommend is learning how to find and process water. Clean water is just one of the most important things uh, next to fire that you can learn how to find and use. Uh, of course, there are some environments where there's not much water at all. The desert, uh, some mountain areas, 
and uh, you just have to really know where those water sources are located really beforehand before you go into an environment like that but if you live in a place like we do there's plenty of water it's just not all clean and so you always need to have some sort of a metal a stainless steel or titanium container with a screw on lid so that you can boil the water for purification and then put the lid on it after it cools so that you can carry it with you when you leave. Uh, the other thing is important to have some cotton material, either a t-shirt or a bandana, you could use a sock, hopefully a clean one, but uh, to pre-filter your water to get a lot of the debris out of it known as turbidity, you want to remove all of that. Uh, as much as possible, you could drink it, it'll be purified, but it just, uh, nobody likes to drink chunky water. The next thing that I would consider as a survival priority would be shelter. You know, if you get out in a situation like this and you're not prepared for it, you can easily freeze to death. Uh, I think the high today is only supposed to be about 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's pretty chilly, and of course your body uh, it needs to be much warmer than that and so heat always goes from a warmer to a colder uh, object and so even just sitting on a log like this will suck the heat out of your body and cool you down uh, rapidly. So you know it's always easier to take shelter than it is to make shelter and your first line of defense of course as shelter goes is the clothes that you wear. You should always be dressed for the occasion. And so proper layering with an outer waterproof layer of clothing is just highly recommended. Uh, you really need your outer layer, even if it's just a shell. And that, of course, means that you can take off the outer layer when it stops raining or snowing and you're able to uh, endure the environment and, and whatever Mother Nature throws at you uh, with uh, hopefully a minimal amount of safety at least. You know, then even like I've got down here, just a cheap $10 uh, 6x8 tarp. Uh, is just super awesome for when you're out in the woods. And so when, you, when you're in the wilderness and you know it's easier to put up than even the simplest of debris shelters. Even though you have the skills and ability and I would recommend everybody learn how to build debris huts, uh, even just having a simple lightweight tart like that along with you means you could put it over top of your shelter and it can just really really help you to uh, make it 100% waterproof, you have to use a lot less materials, and it can save calories, uh, which is of course uh, our very next uh, item that we're going to talk about today is getting food to eat in a survival situation. Stay tuned. Well, we all need to eat eventually. Uh, I know that we teach in survival that the average person can go 30 days or so without food. But uh, believe me, by about the end of the first week, and for some even before that, you're going to feel really tired and weak, and it's going to make you out of sorts, uh, can cause depression, and a lot of other issues when you're in a survival environment. And so uh, you can mitigate some of that by practicing fasting now. And there are people that do that just so their body is trained to deal with not having food in a survival situation. And of course it has a lot of physiological health benefits as well as some spiritual benefits. And so it's a good idea to practice fasting. And, and along with that, when you get in a survival situation, if you think you're going to be rescued pretty soon, you may not worry too much about food. Uh, you know, most people can go two, three, four days easily without eating anything uh, with a minimal amount of discomfort. And so you may decide to focus on the other survival priorities and just leave food until later. If you decide then that you're going to be there long term and, and you haven't been rescued yet, then you might want to turn your attention to uh, getting food. Of course, with that, you should also learn to practice how to make uh, wilderness snares and uh, various deadfall configurations. Uh, those are always good to know. You should put out at least 10 of them when you're in a survival situation. Always understanding, of course, that you, know, you may not get anything. Uh, professional hunters and trappers uh, often uh, go out and run their trap lines or go out hunting and uh, don't get anything. So always be prepared for that disappointment. Uh, it's good to have that hope of having those snares and traps working for you while you're gone. But uh, again, uh, don't expect that you're going to have something. It's also easier to, uh, let me grab this, I carry a little food bag with me. And uh, it's easier to, to, to take food with you than it is to try to catch it. And uh, so I would just recommend as part of your survival priorities, always have two or three days worth of food, even if it's just uh, ramen noodles 
or some bullion cubes uh, or hard candy. Those will fit even the, the smallest of mini kits usually. And uh, those are added calories and flavor uh, to your wild edibles. Uh, the problem with gathering wild edibles is that, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of calories in it. And you can spend a lot of time gathering wild edibles. Uh, also keep in mind that there are people who devote their entire lives uh, to learning about uh, herbs and, and wild things that you can gather and eat. And uh, there are many, many things out there. But what I would encourage everyone to focus on is learn 10 common, easily found, easily identified, uh, wide ranging in their habitat uh, types of wild edibles that you can personally gather and eat. I heard something big in the woods behind me back there. Well, anyway. Uh, it's always good to make sure that you know 10 well. It's better to know 10 well than 100 plants, just sort of, uh, because you need to be familiar with things so that you're not accidentally eating something that would make you sick. And I would recommend getting out there and actually eating it. Make yourself a wilderness salad. Uh, unfortunately, of course, there's not a whole lot of calories and protein uh, in wild edibles. Uh, they will fill your stomach, they'll make you feel better, and it's, it's certainly better than nothing. And you can nibble as you go, uh, you know, and of course berries and things like that are usually, mo most people recognize them, and if not, uh, you should get some experience. One word on wild edibles, it's always best to learn from someone else. You can look in a book, you can look at pictures, and some of them have good colored pictures. Uh, the line drawings in some books are pretty pitiful, but uh, it's always best to learn from someone else if you can. Uh, they'll help you identify it and how to process it and eat it and so uh, it just kind of keeps you out of some of those danger zones from some of those foods that can poison you or make you sick. Um, also, uh, another thing to remember is catching fish is going to be probably the easiest way to get protein in the wilderness assuming that there's a large enough body of water around you that actually has fish in it. We have a large creek back here behind us and, and there are ponds and things. Uh, we're not too far uh, from a large river and so I know that I can catch fish. So what I have in my kit is I always have a minimum of about 10 to 12 fishing hooks. Uh, smaller hooks are better. Uh, remember you can catch a big fish on a small hook but you can't catch a small fish on a big hook and so it's better to have uh, small hooks. I like the number six uh, size hooks really well. And then another thing to consider is uh, worms, grubs, and insects. I don't know that sounds gross to a lot of people, but remember that in a lot of third world countries, uh, people eat insects and grubs uh, with relish. They really enjoy it, and it's a part of their normal daily diet. So I would encourage you to get past that squeamish factor and uh, go out there and, and find you uh, some grubs and worms and uh, learn how to process them and eat them. And uh, you, you might be surprised uh, that you'll like it after a while. And of course they don't run very fast and they're easy to catch. They're usually plentiful uh, in certain areas. And so that's a good idea for you when it comes to getting some food in a survival situation. The next thing we want to talk about is signaling. Just remember that three of anything is considered a distress signal. It could be three signal fires, it can be three blasts on a whistle, uh, it could be three shots in the air, uh, it could be uh, three flags fluttering in the breeze, uh, so anything like that. So as soon as you get your first survival priorities figured out, the next thing you need to work on is being rescued. And of course, the first thing to being rescued is make sure you leave word with someone. Uh, if they don't hear from you within a certain allotted amount of time, Make sure that, uh, that they know where you are and the general area you're going to be and they can send search and rescue to your location. And of course as soon as you hear the plane or the helicopter, uh, you want to be able to signal them. So being prepared to signal is very, very important uh, and having a few things with you, a uh, brightly colored orange t-shirt for instance or uh, you know, a signal whistle, a small handheld flare. Uh, all of those things are good. A signal mirror that you can signal planes uh, or helicopters and other rescuers can be seen for many miles on a clear sunny day. So all of those things are really important and I would encourage you to practice learning how to signal for help and uh, what that consists of and what people are looking for. By the way, I like earth tone uh, colors and, and uh, tarps and things like that, but they say that the most visible color uh, for search and rescue is a blue tarp. That color of blue really doesn't occur naturally too much anywhere. And so uh, a blue tarp stretched out, laid out 
uh, or over top of your shelter is really easy to spot from the air. So that might be a good tip for you to keep in mind when it comes to signaling. For Our help. next survival priority is navigation. Now, it's really important when you first go out, as you're walking through the woods, down the trails, through the mountains and valleys, make sure that you look around you as you go. Pay attention to the rocks, uh, unusual formations, uh, trees that are bent or broken in a certain way, uh, certain hills and mountains, the way that things appear to your eye. Because when you turn around and go the other way, things are going to look a little bit different. But when you have placed that in your mind as something you've seen before, it will help you navigate and stay on course. Of course, you should always have basic compass skills and don't just rely on a GPS because batteries fail, sometimes the signal doesn't come through and uh, there are a lot of people who have gotten lost or in trouble and actually gotten into a survival situation, even died by relying on a GPS. So a compass and a map, preferably a topographical map, learn how to read it, learn how to navigate and uh, have a map of the area that you're going to and that way you will know where you are generally most of the time and be able to navigate your way out of the wilderness. Once you are at your location, say you're in a survival situation, uh, it, draw a self map of the area. Hopefully you have thoughtfully packed some paper and a pencil uh, along with you. The nice thing about a pencil is they don't freeze up so even in cold weather a pencil will write and uh, just draw a self map of where the water is located, where the berry patch is, and, and uh, you know, an area perhaps where you're uh, gathering other wild edibles. But it's good to have a basic map. That way you know the area, you know where you are. And uh, if, if nothing else, if you have to leave camp, uh, you can tack it to a tree or pin it somewhere to the ground with a, a peg and uh, circle where you're going to be going at any given time. And uh, maybe if your rescuers come to camp and you're not there, then they'll be able to follow your self-drawn map to where you are. The next item we want to talk about in our seven items for survival and our seven priorities is first aid. I would recommend that everybody take a first responder course or some kind of a, a wilderness medical course, uh, even a tactical uh, course that teaches how to fix up people with various types of, of wounds and traumas. Uh, because it's important information to know. You need more in your uh, basic first aid kit than just band-aids and aspirin. Uh, the store-bought kits really don't cover it. You need to build your own kit, know what's in it, know how to use it, uh, know how to use a tourniquet, know how to make a makeshift tourniquet, know how to make slings and splints for arms and legs, uh, know how to uh, deal with a sucking chest wound. Uh, that doesn't just happen in, in battles, it also happens when people trip and fall onto stobs or, or into a limb or something, it can get stabbed uh, with uh, some sort of a stick, badly cut with a knife, a saw, a hatchet, uh, all of those things. It's very important for you to know how to manage bleeding and how to apply first aid as well as how to apply self-aid to yourself in a situation like that. So these skills are really important for you to know uh, to learn and to own them so that in a situation uh, you'll be able to deal with it. I would also recommend getting a survival medicine handbook of some sort. There are several different ones you can get on Amazon or other places and uh, they're small, pocket sized. Uh, you can even get some of them on waterproof paper I believe and uh, put that in with your first aid kit uh, because unless you are a, a trained physician or a nurse practitioner or one of the other uh, persons in the medical field, uh, you may not have that first responder knowledge to be able to deal with every situation that you'll encounter, uh, even with some minimal training. So I would recommend getting a handbook and taking it with you and build your own first aid kit so that you know what's in it, practice using it, become familiar with all your stuff, and uh, that'll stand you in good, in good stead if something happens, which of course we hope it doesn't and you uh, have a good time uh, out in the wilderness. So this next item that we're going to talk about, uh, it's seven survival priorities plus one. And the plus one is self-protection. Now, there are many predators in the world, both four-legged and two-legged. And usually in the wilderness, we really only worry about the four-legged ones. And there's a lot of ways to deal with that. You can build a barrier with thorns, uh, thorny branches from different trees. And uh, I know in Africa, the acacia uh, bushes, you can build a lot of neat shelter protection of that, but we don't have that in our part of the world. 
but uh, you can build different kind of barriers, even just using sticks, something that would keep the animals from being able to get to you quickly. Uh, you could make a spear, well, you can sharpen a stick and fire hard in the edge, you know. I would never recommend fastening your knife to a stick and using that as a spear. If you should happen to stick it into a wild animal uh, and it runs off with your spear, uh, then you're really in a bad situation. So never never use your, your knife in a survival situation as a spear. That's just my opinion, but I think it's good advice. Uh, the other thing is this. Uh, you have to decide how you want to deal with the wildlife in your area. Each area is different. Uh, we do have some bears in our area. Uh, they're small black bears and uh, they're not seen very often. We do have a lot of coyotes. Uh, there have been a few other things seen, but most, there's not too many dangerous animals around here. We do have, of course, poisonous snakes and things like that. But uh, most of the time, dealing with those animals, those predators, uh, it, it's a lot of it's because uh, you've intruded into their area and sometimes it's because you're cooking and eating food. Uh, you should never, of course, cook and eat food uh, where you're going to be sleeping. Always try to do that away somewhere. And also, the nice thing about having a food bag like this is you can take this somewhere to a tree and uh, throw a line over a limb and hoist it up, you know, pull it up where it's suspended high enough, 10, 12 feet off the ground so that uh, the average predator can't get to it. And uh, that's just really good general advice, not just for your food, but for toothpaste, deodorants, anything that you might have with you in the wilderness uh, that you might have packed uh, camping or, or just practicing bushcraft. Always keep in mind that wild animals are attracted to scents of different things. And so be careful about that. And so uh, always a good idea to uh, just keep in mind that uh, in a wilderness situation, you know, things can sneak up behind you. Uh, so it's good if you can build your shelter up against a cliff or a large log, uh, you know, some kind of a, of a rock outcropping, uh, just to have something against your back where animals or predators can't sneak up behind you and attack you. I appreciate you all coming along on this little excursion today. Uh, a lot of snow here in uh, southern Ohio, and my water is boiling, and I'm going to pour my uh, powdered apple cider drink into it and uh, stir that up and we're going to enjoy it. It's another good reason to have a long spoon to reach all the way to the bottom of your container. It's pretty good. Let that cool off a little bit. Set it over here in the snow. And it's falling over. It's just melting sideways. There we go. All right. Well, thanks for joining me on this little expedition and discussing our seven survival priorities plus one. I appreciate all of you, my new subscribers, everybody that's been watching, and I want to thank all of you. I hope you all have a wonderful and happy new year this year, and uh, appreciate your support, and we'll talk to you on the next video.
One more important thing about survival priorities. We went through a list of seven plus one, and there are some that will take precedence over others depending on your situation. For instance, if you are in a survival situation that's brought on by a plane crash, a car crash, you're out snowmobiling and you have an accident and you're injured, then first aid or self-aid could be at the very top of your list and you need to go immediately to that to staunch the bleeding and bind up whatever it is is broken before you can then engage in your other survival tasks. And of course, anytime you're injured in a survival situation, it really complicates and makes it a lot worse. Uh, the other thing is, depending on the weather, uh, you may not need fire, first of all. Uh, if it's raining, uh, your first thing should be to put up shelter, perhaps, or seek shelter in a cave or a rock overhang, uh, something of that sort. So uh, fire, while it's probably the most important first skill to learn, uh, there's a lot of other reasons why you might need to do something else. Uh, generally speaking, food and water are not your immediate concerns when you get into a survival situation, but the, the three that can take precedence, generally speaking, are going to be your first aid or self-aid, and then your fire and your shelter. Any one of those three can take precedence and go to the top of the list, depending on what caused you to be in that survival situation. This is James Bender for Waypoint Survival. Please like, share, and subscribe, and make sure and press that bell button to stay notified of all of our upcoming videos, and we'll talk to you next time.